We're glad that you're able to join us. Before the message starts, will you take a moment to pray? Pray for God's clarity. Pray for God's understanding as you hear the message. Also take a moment to read the Scripture. Read the Scripture so that you can see the words in a different way. Hear the words in a different way. So that God's Holy Spirit is able to open up your hearts and God's transforming love then is able to come through the message. As you are able, will you please make a note of at least one thing that you will apply to your life this week based on the message that you hear? Let's get into it. Three. Now, with the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has, um, he goes up to uh, the mountaintop. And so again, within the Hebrew tradition, when you are on the mountain, that is a, a divine place, a divine place of revelation. And so then as a rabbi would or as a teacher would, he sits down and then he's really preaching. He's giving this sermon to his uh, disciples. And so those disciples are gathered close around him. But because he's up higher, he's able to look out at all of his followers. And he sees within all the people, people from all walks of life and those who are struggling. And so he gives this word. And so as we, we can sort of picture this where he is um, um, elevated and he's talking and he's, he's not only um, preaching, but he's giving a message of hope. And so when you hear these beatitudes, don't necessarily uh, understand them as a, uh, uh, a script or a way to live a righteous life. Because part of this is Jesus giving us an escalator, anyways, a thing when Christ comes back again. I got to get a little warmed up yet today. So he's given this promise that once the eschaton happens, that, that when, when Christ comes again and when, when God's reign is truly manifest on this earth, all people will be blessed. Because, you know, when we start to hear that word blessed or favored, you know, a lot of times it'll, and, and I know the Bible will refer to God's favor. Um, but then I'll see a lot of people sometimes will mention, well, you know, God's favor is upon me. And part of me wants to say, well, does God favor you and not me? You know, how's that work? So, um, you know, we look at God's blessings as out there for, for all people. Um, but a lot of times in our society, in our culture, we see blessings as, um, you know, things, right? Products. Uh, life's gone really well. You know, I've been blessed. You know, we've got a good house or, you know, a good place to live. And so we can start to list these material things that we see as God's blessings. But then what happens when we get sick, right? Do we really care about our house as much as much as we want God to be with us and heal us, that God to be with us maybe in our last days on this earth uh, when we are ready, when we know that, that physical healing may not be the answer and that soon we'll be with God uh, for eternity. And so there, all of a sudden, God's peace and God's blessing and, and God's promises take on this whole new realm of importance. And so, um, anyways, let's go. Chapter 5, the Beatitudes. Everybody ready? So when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your re reward is great in heaven. Indeed. Indeed. So you should have a handout in your bulletin that has the Micah 6 verses on it, correct? So let's uh, pull that out. So where would we find the book of Micah? What part of the Bible? 
Old Testament. Micah, a prophet around the 8th century B.C., uh, during the King Hezekiah, and Micah sees that the people of Israel are sort of being idolatrous. They are not uh, living the ways of justice, and they're really getting caught up in themselves. And so Micah is the first one to predict the destruction of Jerusalem. And so Micah then has a word that has lived throughout the ages and really speaks to us today. Because what really captivated me about this text was those words, you know, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. So those three sort of phrases, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly, they're really a challenge to us. They're a summary of all the law. They're the summary of all of what What Jesus has spoken of, you know, we are to love God with all of ourselves and love our neighbors as ourselves. And in doing that, in response to that, we do justice. We love kindness. We walk humbly with God. So I have a question for you. Will you be the reason that someone else smiles today? Will you be the reason that someone else smiles today? Right, Because we come here to learn and we want God to be working in our life. And so when we leave here, if we truly are uh, doing justice and and, and loving kindness and walking humbly, we should then be a blessing to somebody else. How we interact with them should cause them to, to smile and say, hey, thanks. That went really well. I appreciate that. I love you. You were great. Or maybe I don't know you, but thank you for what you did. So in other words, with them, their encounter with you, it impacts them. It changes them. They smile because of that. Now, another reason I like this text and what really was jumping out is there's, there's a conversation that's happening between God and God's people. There's a conversation that's happening between God and us that is written down. And so we can read through here. And so what I did is, is on the left-hand side of your paper, you have the text. And on the right-hand side is sort of a paraphrase of what it may mean to us or how we might interpret it. And there's really three voices as we go through here. There is God, and then there's the voice of the people, and then there's the voice of Micah, the prophet, um, calling out to us what God is saying. And so hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills, hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, And you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent you before Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised and what Balaam, son of Baor, answered him and what happened from Shedeum to Gilgal that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. And now the voice, second voice comes in. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And the third voice comes in. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love love kindness, and walk humbly with the Lord. And so we see on the right-hand side here where God is saying, hey, I'm listening And all of nature is listening. They are witnessing. It's sort of God bringing us in front of, um, you know, almost like a court. You know, God is going to plead his case. He's going to contend. And the Lord says, I have an issue with you. But he doesn't come after us in an angry, vengeful way. There's There's like this pleading. There's this loving. There's a parent that's trying to get the child to understand. Don't you see I love you? Answer me. Tell me what you're thinking. And so then we respond with, you know, what have I, you know, the Lord says, what have I done to you? In what way have I burdened you? Why do you tire of me? This is God still saying um, to them, you know, what is, what is really so tough of what I'm asking of you? And so then we respond 
Um, remember those other times um, later on. Well, God, what do you really want from me? And there's sort of this movement upwards. You know, we start off with little things. You know, you want me to come to church more? Do you want me to give more? Do you want me to serve more? Pray more? What should I bring? Right? We start, we start trying to respond, well, God, what does you really want to do in my life? Because God has also reminded them, you know, that whole King Balak and, and, and when you were in really dark troubles and when you were held in bondage, I was there. I brought you out of that. And so we can start to think back, yeah, when I was sick or I had those money troubles or there was something going on in my family, right? God kind of reminds us of that. See, God, I have been with you all this time. But we start to put some distance in there, and we start to put these conditionings on there, and we start saying, you know, God, what is it that you really want to do? Because we then start getting caught in about what we've done, as if we have done enough, and we start getting idolatrous in in our thinking. We start putting these barriers up there, and we start thinking, well, you know, I'm a good Christian. I come to church every week. You know, God, if you're upset with somebody, be upset with somebody else who's not in the pew right today, right? Because I'm here. And then we kind of get in there and, you know, seriously, God, what do I got to do? Cough up a lung? I got to give you a kid, right? Who can quote the movie? You know, you're going to have to cough up a lung or I'm going to have to cough up a lung, right? Famous movie line, Ferris Bueller, right? Cough up a lung, okay. Anyways, so we get to the point where the, God says, you know everything that's required of you. It's already been laid out there. Why are you asking me if you should be doing all these other things or giving all these other offerings? Because I, God, don't want all that. Bottom line is, I just want an honest relationship with you. So in other words, I, God, am loving you faithfully. How then do we respond to that? What is that appropriate response to God's faithful love with us? Now, if you want a really cool story to read, you need to read about King Balak and the divine seer sort of prophet Balaam, okay? I'll give you a hint. You can find it in the book of Numbers, also in the Old Testament, because in there, there's a story of a talking donkey. Did you know that? Talking donkey in the Bible? It is pretty awesome. The donkey starts talking. We don't see that every day, do we? And when the donkey starts talking, it's because the prophet uh, Balaam, he's, really, he wasn't, he's, not, he's not an Israelite, so he wasn't a true prophet of the Israelite people, but he had a way that he could see things, but he would, um, God would use him. And so um, the king wanted him to curse the Israelites. Well, his prophet's like, I can't do that. I can only say what God tells me to say. Well, he goes to see the king, and that makes God mad. And so while he's riding his donkey to see the king, God says an angel to kill him. Well, the donkey sees the angel and goes off one way. Three different times, the donkey veers away from the angel that was standing with the sword to kill uh, this guy. And so every time, uh, Balaam, the prophet, kept getting upset at the donkey and hitting the donkey. And, you know, eventually the donkey lays down, and um, Balaam says, I'm so mad at you right now, I can just kill you myself. And the donkey... (laughs) starts talking then. I'm like, hey, what have I done to you? Right? I mean, this is, this is a great story. And the, if anybody's ever worked with animals or, or kids, right, you know, you just get to that frustration point. Okay, not where you would ever kill your kid, but you just get frustrated, right? And so the donkey looks up at him and says, what have I ever done to you? Haven't I been your donkey forever? And Balaam's like, yes. And so isn't it unusual that I have, I've never went off path three times in a row, Right? He's like, yeah, and then the God opens the eyes of Balaam so he can see the angel that was going to kill him. And he's like, oh, okay, all right. So it's a great little lesson here. You need, so it's in Numbers uh, chapter 22, and I think it starts in verse 22. So I would encourage you to definitely read that. Well, the prophet Micah's name is Micah-L. And so uh, Michael, Michael, and so Micah's name means who is like God who is like God. And so we see here where God has, again, reached out and and talked to to us. And, you know, we start to, and this is kind of where I want you to start identifying, is if we start to go through the motions of our faith, if we start to go through the motions of our religion, 
how then do we start missing the point of what God is wanting us to do, right? Because don't we all start praying to God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Just give me my purpose in life, you know? And then the scripture says, you've already got everything you need to know. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. And so we start thinking to ourselves, well, God, what do you mean, do justice? And so I want you to start thinking in your life, what does it mean for me to do justice in my life? What does it mean for me to love kindness and walk humbly in my life? Because everything we're talking about here has to translate over into everyday experiences. Yes, it translates over into how you interact with your partner. It translates into how you interact with your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, how you treat people at school, how you treat people at work. So when you're feeling victimized, when you're feeling like someone's um, getting the upper hand on you, how do you do justice to that person? How do you love kindness when in your mind you're thinking all kinds of thoughts that I can't repeat here, right? And then how do you in all those ways, walk humbly or walk sensibly with God. In other words, how are you letting God be in your life? And how are you letting God and giving God time to move in your life and work with those other people? But, you know, the people of Israel at this time, they were really getting caught up in themselves and proud of what they do. And don't we do that when we start to go through the motions? We start looking around at all of our accomplishments. Look how hard I've worked. Look at what I've done. Look what I've given. Look what I've accomplished over here. We start seeing how hard we worked. And again, when something hits us, a tragedy hits us, or some big time life event hits us, all of a sudden we realize how truly helpless we can be at times, how much we truly have to rely on God's strength. Reminds me of a story of a scientist who had worked for years and years and years to make the best tomato that he could. And so he finally devised the best and made a tomato seed that he knew would produce a tomato that would be the ripest and juiciest and sweetest tomato ever. And so he challenged God. See, God, I can make a better tomato than you. God said, okay, I'll take that challenge. And so the day came where they were going to grow the tomatoes. And so they went there. They, God got his seed. and Scientists got his seed. And they went to plant them. And God said, well, wait a minute. You got to make your own dirt too. What about your own air? and the water, and the wind that'll pollinate, right? So all of a sudden we start realizing, oh yeah, there's so much more that God does for me that I don't even realize because it's just got a part of God's plan in terms of what unfolds and lives before us. So when we go through the motions, how does that become idolatrous? How does that cause us to not do justice? How does that cause us to mistreat other people and interpret things so that it benefits us? How do we respond to God in the offering plate? Yes, what you give in the offering plate is a spiritual decision. How you respond to God is part of your spiritual life. How are you trusting in God? What are you giving? What are you doing with the resources that God has given you? How are you using them, whether it is within the offering plate or whether it's in the gifts that you've been given, and how are you using them to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with the Lord. When we start to go through the motions, it can cause us also to withdraw from other people, right? Because if our faith becomes sort of stale or we start, you know, wondering what's happening, well, then we start thinking, well, you know, we kind of have it all right. And those people over there, maybe they don't have it right. Maybe they don't worship the right way or something. You know, it's just, then all of a sudden we start creating divisions and classifications and we don't... We miss seeing that God has created all kinds of people. Last night, um, I, was, I was working in my study, and I heard uh, the movie, uh, Remember the Titans, was on, right? A great movie. But my kids, who are eight and nine, were watching it, and I'm like, ah, that's got a lot of stuff in it that really needs to be explained, okay? Well, I was working on something, and so I went in there, and I was trying to explain some things. I'm like, you got to understand, this was way back in the 60s. And things were a lot different in the 60s than they are now. Because they said, you know, we don't care what somebody looks like and what their skin color is, right? And I'm like, yeah, you know. And, and, and raising children 
has really helped me understand how much um, prejudice and racism is taught and is passed down. Kids don't grow up hating and mistreating other people. I can remember when Jacob was five, and uh, there was a girl in his class, whatever, came up to him and says, will your mom let you have a brown girlfriend? And, his, and he comes home and he's telling me this. He's like, yeah, so, so, so you know, she asked me if it was okay to have a brown girlfriend. I'm like, well, what'd you say? He's like, I said, yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, you know. So those things, you know, they have to be taught. So anyways, um, we changed the movie because it was just too much last night to uh, try to explain all that. And at that age, they ask 100 questions for every five seconds of movie. So anyways, okay, so we're moving on. The other reason is why does this become important? Because again, when we start going through the motions and we start um, relying on our own strength, instead of what God can do for us, what happens is, is it can cause us then to have an issue with God, it's as if God has messed it up, right? As if God isn't listening, as if God isn't answering our prayers. And then we can get really mad at people in the church because if you look around, who makes up the church, right? The people, okay? No one here is perfect, I'm not perfect. And so we will, at some point, disappoint you, fail you, misunderstand something, miscommunicate. It will happen in the church, okay? But it's how we resolve to do all that. But then what happens is we start putting these conditions on our faith and say, well, God, you need to do this and that. And then we start relying on our own strength and our own issues. And then we stop coming to church because we got to get some stuff figured out on our own. And so what we start doing is we start doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing instead of coming to church or being around God's people that might, God might be able to use to support you and edify you and help you talk through something and support or just minister to you and be with you in whatever pain or depression or oppression that you might be in. We start pulling away because I got to get it figured out. And then once I think I got it figured out, then I can come back as if we have to work out our own sense of self-righteousness. Like, we've got to get something a little bit more right in order for it to be okay for God to work with us. When in reality, God already knows what you're dealing with, and God's sitting there pleading, come on, I love you. Just trust me. Just walk with me. Just do justice in your life and love kindness, and I will bring you the healing that you need. But instead, when we start going through the motions, it's easier for us to rationalize and step away and be away. So I want to ask you right now, how will you live this out today? If you want to shout out an answer, that's fine. How will you do justice in your life? Hey, we didn't come here to just sing a bunch of happy songs, all right? Yeah. How will we love kindness? How will we do justice? Okay. So right now you're thinking in your mind, oh yeah, I got this going on with my spouse. I got this going on at school. I got this going on at work. How will I do justice in that situation? Yeah. Have faith, definitely. Love and take care of your grandson, no matter how frustrating your grandson may be, right? Yeah. Take them one day at a time. Yeah. So we can start to see that maybe when you get in an argument with somebody or a friend and you want to get them back, how does doing justice come in, into that? How does loving kindness come into being when you're thinking of what words to say or what words not to say? How does walking humbly with God come into that argument? or in terms of what you're praying for, or what you want in your life. These are some of the real world impacts of what God is saying to us, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly, and that is your task, that is your challenge. And one of the first things that we can do is come to the communion table, okay? Starting over. 
coming to that communion table between you and Christ, where Christ has said, I love you, and I am in covenant with you, and I'm going to spill my blood and break my body so that you can have eternal life and salvation forever, so that when you take this cup and this bread is a tangible reminder of what God has said thousands of years ago to all of God's people, that God continues to plead and say, I love you, come home to me. Amen. We hope you found today's message applicable to this season in your life. We know that the seeds that God has shown through His Scripture or through the messages you've heard today will help produce the fullness of God's love and grace within your life. If you have questions about what you've heard today, will you contact Pastor Kay and I because we really want to support you in your faith journey. As always, we're thankful that you're part of what God is doing here at the Gender Road Christian Church so that we can go beyond just worshiping God but serving Jesus and helping others understand the goodness and love of Christ Jesus in this world.